Uh, I'm going to read some sections from a story called A Frisbee is Not a Toy. You could stay, Beth said on the phone to Keith. The couch pulls out. Claire's head snapped to attention. She was studying again in front of the TV, or making the pretension of. Beth moved the phone away from her mouth and said to her, didn't we agree? No homework with the TV on? Claire sighed, slapped her book shut, and thumped it on the coffee table. She stretched her legs out and crossed her ankles on top of the book. Then she picked up the remote and began surfing the channels. I've got to go, Beth said into the phone. Claire turned up the volume. Canned laughter blared through the rooms. Steadying herself, Beth filled the empty tea kettle and adjusted the flame underneath. Please turn that down, she called out firmly. Nothing. Beth stepped into the living room and looked at her daughter with what she hoped conveyed non-threatening authority. Claire, turn that down. Claire fiercely thumbed a button on the remote and the TV blinked off. The sudden silence was jarring. So why did James leave? Claire asked. She crossed her arms over her chest and stared at the empty screen. Beth suppressed her sigh. She was tired of how Claire liked to bring up her ex-stepfather at certain times. In the kitchen, she took a cup down from the cabinet. He said he didn't think he was making me happy. Claire snorted. Didn't you tell him that nothing makes you happy? I thought he knew that. Claire did not laugh. So, this Keith, what is it? Third time is a charm? Don't be ridiculous, Claire. Beth arranged a tea bag in the cup, her heart banging in her chest for no good reason. Beth knew Claire missed James, really the only father she'd known, but what could Beth do about that? I'm not the one who's being ridiculous, Mother. Take a look in the mirror, why don't you? Don't you care how laughable you are, cradle robber? Skipping ahead here. Not that jerk again, she said Sunday morning, passing Keith asleep on the couch. In the kitchen, Beth offered Claire a glass of orange juice. Claire shook her head no. She was refusing more than juice. It was understood. Claire wore her usual uniform, Beth's old wedding dress, which she chopped off high on the thigh and dyed black. Another mistake in a chain of them. When they moved, after James, Claire had gone through the boxes destined for goodwill, honing in on the dress with what seemed to Beth uncanny accuracy. The next thing she knew, Claire had transformed the dress into her new statement. When will you be back? Beth asked Claire, now on her way to the front door. The door slammed shut, but Claire had heard. Beth went after her and called out. As Claire turned around, the weak morning sun shot through the clouds, a spare straggly ray, a celestial gasp. Claire was silhouetted. What, she said, aggrieved. See you at dinner? If we're done studying by then, be done, or be prepared for the consequences. You're so dramatic, Claire tossed her head. The sun disappeared and the landscape faded to gray. I'll call. When? Claire stood blinking, then said, You better go eat, Anne. Anne? Anorexia, what do you weigh? 80 pounds? You look terrible. Claire resumed walking. When should I expect your call? Beth insisted. When it's dinner time, whenever. Claire tossed the words over her shoulder. Her blonde hair sheeting down the back of her leather jacket looked dull, and a black skirt pulled over clips. Claire's hips as she walked. Be back for dinner, Claire. Inside, Keith had helped himself to the glass of juice. Can I take a shower, Anne? He asked, his face wreathed in smiles. I'm skipping ahead. At the park, throngs of people bustled along the sidewalk, looping the pond. Over there, Beth pointed to a comparatively empty section of grass. Keith looked at her side like a faithful pet. He was too large, too close. He turned the air humid with his clammy Irish skin. Beth shivered. We should have brought a blanket to sit on. No sitting. He pulled a frisbee from his backpack. No, Beth said. 
But Keith ran across the lawn and motioned with the frisbee that Beth should prepare to catch it. She turned away and kept going where she pointed. Keith shouted something behind her. The frisbee clapped down on the grass in front of her. Beth stepped around it. She heard Keith running up behind her, scooping the frisbee in his travel. Beside her, his quick breath sounded moist. Beth picked up her pace. What's wrong? Nothing's wrong, she said. I'll teach you. I know how. Not entirely true. She hadn't held a frisbee in years. I just don't want to. Also, a half lie. She didn't feel like bumbling about in foolish configurations of inadequacy. But she would have liked playing well. Come on, Keith persisted. Then Beth spotted a solution. He had his own frisbee. Sure, the boy said affably. He gestured to Keith with his frisbee, and Keith took off running. Beth sat on the grass and watched them move in a dance of bodies anyone could appreciate. She looked down at her own legs, stretched out before her, thin and pale. There was a dip in her left shin bone. She pulled herself to sit cross-legged, filled with a longing she couldn't name. The boy plopped down beside her. Your turn, he said. I'm no good at it, Beth told him. I'll show you. It's easy. He shrugged his shoulders. Oh, I don't know, Beth said. Not now. Keith swung himself down beside them. He was sweaty, slightly panting in the way that police some men to do. Thanks, man, he said. He extended his hand. Keith. Hector. The boy shook Keith's hand. What's your name? Hector turned to her. Beth felt her face flush when she told him. What's your number? What's your number, Beth? I'll call you. Call her, Keith said. We're going to toss a frisbee sometimes, Hector said. Got a pen? 